Okay, thank you. Um, ready to go for me. Um, Polina, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me, for your patience through the process of working um, overseas. Uh, and in advance, I want to thank the, uh, both Alexanders for the translation, um, because I need it and some of you might as well. Um, so thank you all. Um, the title of this is Masculinity, Shame and Violence, the Personal Meets the Political. It could also be called something like Small Men, Big Masculinity. And it's and I, I think the meaning of that will become clear to you as, as we go along. Now, the other thing I want to say in beginning is that the title of the other book that is about to be translated into Russian, which I will say something about later, is called The Guy's Guide to Feminism, which I wrote with uh, the Canadian uh, political scientist, Michael Kaufman. So next screen, please. So, um, so what I want to talk about is uh, the one single great difference between women and men on virtually every single survey that we have. Men and women are pretty much the same in terms of creativity, intellectual ability, parenting, competence. There's one gender difference and it, and it obtains in, in, in virtually all societies and that is violence. Here in the US, men commit 99% of rapes, 92% of robberies, 87% of aggravated assault, 83% of family violence, 82% disorderly conduct, 90% of all murder victims are killed by men, and 98% of all school shootings in the United States are committed by boys. Um, and let me just say that, you know, school shootings are something that we, we lead the world in school shootings. Next. So why is this true? If you ask most people, um, they would say it's biology. You know, if you it, it, survey after survey, they say, why are men more violent than women? The first and most common answer is testosterone. Testosterone causes violence. This is what we hear. And I want to say something about this because I think it's very important for everyone who encounters this argument to have a good response to it. Testosterone does cause violence. It also is a consequence of violence. If you take two men who have the same amount of testosterone, and one, and, and they, they have some kind of competition, usually like a chess match or an arm wrestling match. The winner, his testosterone goes up and the loser, his testosterone goes down. So testosterone is not only the cause of that, but it's also the consequence. The most important thing I think about the testosterone experiments are that testosterone doesn't tell you who to be violent toward. There's something else. And this, I think, is really important when we talk about family violence or men's violence against women. There's a classic experiment, which I'm happy to share with you because I think it is so interesting. It's an experiment where they take five monkeys, five male monkeys, all one year old. And if you know anything about monkeys, what happens is they put the monkeys in the um, in a cage, all five of them, and they immediately sort themselves in a, into a hierarchy. Number one beats up number two, number two beats up number three, number three beats up number four, et cetera. And of course, that, that hierarchy is based on, in part, on testosterone levels. So here's the experiment. They take monkey three out of the cage. Now that's a middle monkey. And, and then they give them a big injection of testosterone. So then they put them back in the cage. And what do you think happens? What happens, what most people will say is he then becomes number one monkey because his testosterone level is so much higher. That is not what happens. What happens is he still avoids monkey one and monkey two, but he absolutely beats the crap out of monkeys four and five. What does this experiment tell us? It tells us that testosterone facilitates violence. It enables violence, but the target of the violence must already be seen as legitimate. This is so important. Men who hit women do not hit their boss. 
men who hit women do not hit their superiors. They target must already be perceived as legitimate. I think this is one of the best, most interesting experiments I've ever heard. And it, I think it undermines all of the argument that, men, that, that basically boys will be boys. So, okay, next slide. If it's not biology, what could it be? This is my part, this is part one. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna talk about the personal level. Listen to this 23 year old boy, a 23 year old stock boy, um, to thinking about, he's asked to think about whether he'd ever commit rape. He hasn't, but he's saying, if I did, he said, he says, and you can read it along with me so I can go quickly here. Let's say I see a woman and she's looking really pretty and really clean and sexy. And she's giving off very feminine, sexy vibes. I think, wow, I would love to make love to her, but I know she's not interested. It's a tease. A lot of times a woman will know that she's looking really good and she'll use that and flaunt it. And it makes me feel like she's laughing at me and I feel degraded. If I were actually desperate enough to rape somebody, it would be from wanting that person, but also it would be a very spiteful thing. Just being able to say, I have power over you so I can do anything I want with you. Because really, I feel they have power over me just by their presence. Just the fact that they can come up to me and just melt me makes me feel like a dummy, makes me feel like I want revenge. They have power over me, so I want power over them. Next text, please. Here's a young man in Canada describing his violence against a woman. She's pissed me off and she won't stop. I grabbed her arm, squeezed her, and slapped her. I've punched her after she put me down in front of my friends. My ex-girlfriend used to cry after we had fight. I had to punch her to get her to stop. I don't know what to do. It's like I know what I should be as a man. I mean, strong, lots of money, a good job, and a beautiful wife. But my life isn't like that. I'm not really much of a man without a good job and lots of money. She makes me so angry when she won't do what I want her to do. It's not supposed to be that way. A girl is supposed to get along with a man. She's supposed to respect him and listen to him. But that never happens to me. I feel like a piece of shit around my girlfriends. It's not right. It makes me feel like a wimp or a pussy. That's not the way things are supposed to be. Next. Okay. So what do we hear in these two texts? What do we hear in these voices? We hear the voice of powerlessness. She has power over me. We hear a voice of entitlement. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And we hear a voice of homosociality. She does it in front of my friends. Many men feel violence is not the initiation of, of, or the expression of power over, but rather an effort to restore power, to retaliate against losing power. We feel small and then we use violence to feel big again. Think of the words that we use for women's beauty. They're words that we use to describe to, a, a violence against men. She's a knockout, a bombshell, a femme fatale, stunning, ravishing, dressed to kill. So we're of course blown away, done in. Um, next please. So that's what I found. In, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I found when I interviewed 400 young men in the U.S. about this very question. Because this, I think, is a real key to understanding vi men's violence. We often think that there's a, a kind of syllogism between uh, men's uh, experience of, uh, well, let me put it this way. Feminism proposed two things. One Men have power over women. And second, individually, women feel powerless. Well, that is a perfect, perfectly symmetrical. Feminism was designed to both empower individual women and rearrange the power dynamics at the social level. So you apply that to men. Men have power over women. Therefore, individually, men must feel powerful. And when you say that to men, they look at you like, you're crazy. I have no power. I'm completely powerless. My wife bosses me around. My boss bosses me around. My kids boss me around. I'm completely powerless. So it seems to me that what we have to address 
is two things. One, the, the asymmetry, the fact that men's power over women doesn't lead to individual men feeling powerless, powerful, sorry. And therefore, it is out of that feeling of powerlessness that we often move to, um, move to violence as a way to restore things. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the ideology of masculinity and the, the fact that it is enforced, and you'll, I'll, I'll say something about that in a moment, how it's reinforced in our interactions with other men. So in my book, Guyland, I interviewed 400 young men ages 16 to 26. Next slide. And here's what I found. That basically, if you add, that the four rules of manhood, the four rules of manhood basically boil down to these. These are idiomatic expressions here in the U.S. I'm sure that you have, a, so, you know, that you have parallels um, in Russia. Um, no sissy stuff. You can never do anything that even remotely hints of femininity. Your masculinity is the repudiation of the feminine. Number two, be a big wheel. We measure masculinity by the size of your paycheck, wealth, power, status. Three, be a sturdy oak. What makes a man a man is that he's reliable in a crisis. And what makes him reliable in a crisis is that he resembles an inanimate object, you know, a rock, a, a tree, <laughs> um, you know, a pillar. And the fourth, give them hell. Exude an aura of daring and aggression. Live life on the edge. Next slide. So those are the four. four. And by far the number one is no sissy stuff. In, on every college campus in the country, um, the most common, in high school as well, the most common put down is that's so gay. Guys are so afraid of appearing to be gay. Um, it, perhaps, you know, and this is, I think, important because there's a significant amount. I think masculinity is in part enforced by gender policing, by guys always being looked at and evaluated by other guys about whether or not they're doing it right. You don't have to believe me. Homophobia is the center, it seems to me, and it has something to do with, of course, with gay LGBT people, but it also has to do with masculinity. Here's the words of my favorite gender theorist in America, Eminem, next slide. Eminem says, now this is 2001. Um, it's a little bit disconcerting for me as an older man to say that, to say that Eminem is now of a previous generation. He just turned 50. Um, the lowest degrading thing you can say to a man when you're battling him is call him a faggot and try to take away his manhood. Call him a sissy. Call him a punk. Faggot to me doesn't mean taking, a faggot means taking away your manhood, right? So it's not about sexuality to him, as you can see here, he's with, that, with um, Elton John. It means it's about manhood. It's about uh, masculinity. It's about proving your masculinity. So what are the effects of homophobia? Next slide. What, is, what are the effects of this gender policing? About in one study found that 2 million students a year in the U.S. are bullied because they were or were thought to be gay. 2 million students. In reality, 75% were straight. For every gay, lesbian, or bisexual youth who's, who reports being harassed, four heterosexual students are targeted because they don't conform to the expected stereotype of masculinity. So that's what homophobia does. What is it? Next slide. Homophobia is less about the irrational fear of gay people or the fear that one might actually be gay or have gay tendencies. It's more the fear that heterosexuals have that others might misperceive them as gay. As one of my friends once said, homophobia is the hate that makes men straight. So let me put this into practice. Next slide, please. As I said, we are the world leader in school shootings. So take a little thought experiment. Imagine all the school shooters are poor black girls in Trenton, Philadelphia, Newark, and Washington, DC. By the way, those four cities 
are, are all cities that are either majority or very high percentage of black uh, population. Wouldn't we be talking about race and class and gender? Of course we would. We would talk about race because they were all black. Uh, we would talk about gender because they were all girls. And we would talk about class. We would talk about how the lower class is a, is a class of violence. But the fact that 98% were middle-class white boys means we don't talk, next slide, we don't talk about that. Of all of the rampage school shootings in the United States, all, all but two were committed by boys. And we're talking about a number of about, of about 115 here. All but two committed by boys. All but six committed by white boys. Almost all, all but five, were in rural or suburban schools. Next, please. So the psychological explanation that we always get whenever there's a white boy who goes on a rampage is we focus on the psychological characteristic of the shooter. It's individual psychopathology. These are disconnected. They have nothing to do with a, a culture. They have nothing to do with those people. They only have to do with individual psychology. These boys were mentally ill. And that's how we describe school shootings, as if they were disconnected, individual psychopathology. This is racist. And the reason it, it, it is, is because what we assume is that white shooters are mentally ill, but black shooters get more cultural explanations, by which I mean, we say, ah, there's something in their culture that leads them to violence. So we, so when race it disaggregates for white people, race tends to make it all about individuals. Whereas for black people, it aggregates, it brings people together. Now, let me talk a little bit then about what I think is the real, real serious um, uh, cause of this violence. Next slide. In, in his amazing book, Violence, uh, from 1998, James Gilligan, who was the psychiatrist in the Massachusetts uh, prison system, says violence has its origin in the fear of shame and ridicule and the overbearing need to prevent others from laughing at oneself by making them weak instead. So it's, it's shame and ridicule, the fear of shame and ridicule. I fear being shamed and therefore I will use violence to make sure that I don't feel that because I make you cry instead. So let me, let, let's look at the school shooters. Next slide. I'm not insane. I'm angry. People respect me now. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, the most, the most famous in Columbine High School in Colorado. We always wanted to do this. This is payback. See, payback, restoration, re retaliation. We've dreamed of doing this for years. This is for all the shit you put us through. This is what you deserve. So again, this is about their entitlement to use violence to restore their sense of masculinity. That's where shame and violence come in at the interpersonal level. We understand, inter, in, in, you know, we understand interpersonal violence by the perception, which, by the way, I need to be very clear. It is a perception that men have that they don't have, that they're powerless. It is their feelings, but it may not, of course, be true, right? Feelings are real, but they may not be true. No therapist would tell you, oh, that's interesting that you feel that way, but your feelings are wrong. <laughs> feelings are feelings. They are real, but they may not be true. They may not be accurate. They may not accurately explain the reality. So, so when I say that men feel powerless, I'm not saying that men are powerless. I'm saying, in fact, that the contradiction, men are, it, men have power over women, many men feel powerless. That's the conflict that we have to explore. And now I want to turn to exploring that at the collective level. I want to talk about political violence. Next slide, please. This is Osama bin Laden. Listen to the language, you'll hear, you, you've heard it already. Our brothers who fought in Somalia saw wonders about the weakness, feebleness, and cowardliness of the U.S. soldier. We believe that we are men, Muslim men, 
who must have the honor of defending Mecca. We do not want American women soldiers defending it. The rulers of America have been deprived of their manhood. They think that the people are women. Next slide. This is right after September 11th. Rocky Suheda says, it's a disgrace that in a population of at least 150 million white Aryan Americans, we provide so few that are willing to do the same. A bunch of towelhead sand niggers put our great white movement to shame. So what he's saying is that he admires the, the terrorists of 9-11 because they were real men. Again, we're shamed by this. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what I'm going to try to talk about now at the collective level, that political violence is gendered violence is men's violence. So what are the themes, again, that I've raised here? One, violence does not come from a feeling of power, of superiority, but often a feeling of powerlessness, of inferiority. It's a way to even the score. Violence is restorative, a way to restore the way things are supposed to be. It comes from the breakdown of patriarchy, of men's power. And finally, violence is a way to ward off shame and humiliation, the humiliation of not being a real man. So the most important thing I want to say about this is that men's violence comes from two places. One, from that feeling of powerlessness, and number two, from that sense of entitlement to power. That combination can be lethal. Next. So here I'm going to talk about the work that I've done in two books, Angry White Men um, and Healing from Hate. Angry White Men, uh, the last chapter, I interviewed about 35 active men, Americans entirely, who were active in the extreme right. This book came out, I should I want to be make you aware, this book came out in, in, in 2013. The name Trump is not in the book at all. Um, so, um, so it, it's entirely based um, on on uh, his what his followers were waiting for, so to speak. Uh, but I interviewed thirty five neo Nazi white skinhead neo neo uh, Nazi um, uh, violent, violent, uh, right wing extremist. And in healing from hate, I I, I looked at four countries in which guys were in the movement and were getting out of the movement. So I interviewed guys who were as they call them, formers in, Sw in Sweden, Britain, the U.S., uh, and Germany. Uh, okay, so here's, um, so here's what I found. Among the white the men that I interviewed that talked about their experiences both in and out of the movement, what I heard was the same language, that same sense of entitlement and powerlessness that I think is so toxic. Uh, next slide. Here, I'm going to show you now a few of the cartoons uh, or the illustrations from white supremacist neo-Nazi um, uh, websites. This one, as you can see, white men built this nation. White men are this nation. Hear the entitlement? Look at him. He's wearing a flak jacket. He's wearing a hard hat. He built the bridge. He flies the plane. That's who white, that's who they are. They're lower middle class white men uh, who believe that they have been pushed aside. Next slide. The National Vanguard says, as Northern males have continued to become more wimpish, the result of the media created image of the new male, more pacifist, less authoritarian, more sensitive, less competitive, more androgynous, less possessive, the controlled media, the homosexual lobby, and the feminist movement have cheered. The number of effeminate males has increased greatly. Legions of sissies and weaklings, of flabby, limp-wristed, non-aggressive, non-physical, indecisive, slack-jawed, fearful males, who, while still heterosexual in theory and practice, have not even a vestige of the old macho spirit so deprecated today left in them. One thing I will say is this is pretty well written for the, you know, the, the guys that I'm talking about. Um, but you can hear it there. Men have been emasculated by feminism, by the homosexual lobby, by modern society. The, the, the national 
uh, the, the national American man is weak and wimpy. We have been emasculated. Next slide. And so we have to learn to survive the feminization of America, keeping women from ruining our life. Now, the next few slides I'm going to show you, the next four are slides. This, this is one where now I want you to look at this guy in the middle because you'll see his face again in, in several other ones. Here is the story of American white male emasculation. Hey, white man, how's your America been looking to you lately? If you don't take it back, they'll damn sure take it over. And you can see he's surrounded by all of the elements of what's taking it over, the Holocaust Museum, Martin Luther King Boulevard, Malcolm X, hip hop, uh, AIDS, gay pride, et cetera. He's been emasculated. Next slide. Look at this one. Again, hey, white man, just what is it going to take you to get you to fight back? Again, look at his face. He, you know, he's so weak and so wimpy. The meek shall inherit nothing. Next, please. Here's one. This is from the, uh, the, the um, SS Action Group in Michigan. And you have this guy in the middle who says, so what if they loot, burn, riot, murder, maim, rob, and rape? No one's bothered me yet. Okay. And the last one, this is, I think, the most poignant. This is from the Aryan Nations. And this beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed girl says, what did you do in the war, Daddy? I'm hungry, Daddy. Why do we have to stand in line for food, Daddy? Why did those bad men make us move to this strange place, Daddy? Where have all the white people gone, Daddy? Why did those dark men take Mommy away? When's Mommy coming home, Daddy? Why didn't you stop them, Daddy? Why didn't you do something? Now that, I think, is the most poignant element. Look at what this has done to him. He has become, uh, he, is, he, he is so emasculated that he has allowed this to happen and he can't even protect his family. Okay, so before, uh, don't, don't advance yet. So joining up, becoming a white supremacist, neo-Nazi skinhead, et cetera, is a way to, now you see them emasculated, reclaim their masculinity. Next slide. Here he is now. Don't be a humble honky. Be a mighty whitey. And here you can see he's taking his revenge. Here's another one. This is, uh, this is uh, especially, uh, I, I, I don't believe that this is um, actually uh, a, a single pho pho photograph. I believe, in fact, that that's Britney Spears' face superimposed on, a, on, a, um, uh, on another body. My, my man is a white racist. If yours is a wimp, dump him and get a real white man and screw the system. So I think, you know, th this fantasy that all of the white women, this is what you get. This is your reward if you join up. Now, I want to show you an illustration. Now, this has nothing to do with white supremacy, this, this comic. But I want you to see the narrative that's contained in this. This is... The, many of you will not know, recognize this. This was um, on comic books uh, in the 1950s and 60s. This was Charles Atlas. That's him on the lower right. Charles Atlas's bodybuilding uh, system. So it basically starts with the... the uh, so I'm going to go through the panels because I want you to see what happens. There, he's in the top right. He's at the beach. And this bully... Um, you know, it, it sort of goes by and kicks sand in their face. Hey, quit kick, kicking that sand in our face. And then he tries to stand up to him. And the bully says, listen here, I'd smash your face. Only you're so skinny, you might dry up and blow away. And then he says, that big bully, I'll get even someday. And look at what she says to him. Oh, don't let it bother you, little boy. Think about how emasculating, little and boy. He's not a big man. He's a little boy. And so he says in the next one, darn it, I'm sick and tired of being a scarecrow. Charles Atlas says he can give me a real body. All right, I'll gamble and get the book. Then later, as you can see, he's looking in the mirror. Boy, it didn't take Atlas long to do this for me. What muscle? And he goes back to the beach, sees the bully, punches him in the face, and she says, oh, Mac, you're a real man after all, right? 
So he's gone from being a little boy to a real man. Now, this narrative of the bully doing something and then uh, the bu being bullied, then doing something transformative to reclaim your manhood and then going back and being a real man. This narrative go moving downward and then upward is the narrative that all of these groups use. Now, I want you to go to the next slide. And what you're seeing here is a racialized view of this from a white supremacist magazine called the White Aryan Resistance, War, the bottom of the left. And so, it, and it's the exact same thing without permission um, of the same cartoon, but now they've racialized the bully. He says, you know, he kicks sand in their face and then he's, you know, he says, all right, listen here, cracker. I'd smash your face, but I need my strength to rape white woman. And he says, that big bully, I'll get even someday. And now she says, oh, don't let it bother you, white boy. Remember before it was little boy. Now it's white boy. So he says in the middle, darn it, I'm sick and tired of being a liberal Democrat. Tom, that's Tom Metzger on the left, the, the founder of White Iron Resistance. And in, you see now in front of the mirror with the swastika and the SS tattoo on his back shoulder, I, you know, and he goes back to the beach, punches him in the face and says, you, you know, fuck you, you dope dealing ghetto ape. And she says, oh, Mac, you're a skinhead after all. And they say, gosh, what a racist. Yes, white and proud. So he's gone from being a white boy to a skinhead. And that, of course, is his transformation. Next slide. So this is what Anders Brering Breivik, who killed 77 people in Oslo in 2011, said about this very same emasculation. He says, the most important reason has to do with the extreme anti-masculine strand of feminism that has permeated Scandinavia for de decades. The male protective instinct doesn't take action because Scandinavian women have worked tirelessly to eradicate it together with everything else that smacks of traditional masculinity. Because of this, feminism has greatly weakened Scandinavia and perhaps Western civilization as a whole. Um, and the next one, Norway and Sweden are countries with extremely high divorce rates. Boys grow up in an atmosphere where masculinity is demonized. They go to a school system where they're viewed as deficient girls. And they're told by the media that men are obsolete and will soon be rendered extinct anywhere. Every, uh, sorry, anyway. So this is the same language, the emasculation of men that leads to that kind of collective violence. Let me give you one more quote that I think illustrates this as be way better than I could, and then I'll conclude. Uh, wait, did, um, did we not? Next slide, do we not have that? What's the next one? So next one please. Okay. Right. All right. So this is, these are the themes, I'm sorry, these are the themes that predict high levels of interpersonal and social violence. This is from anthropologists who basically looked at cross-culturally, what are the characteristics? And you'll see the same sorts of things, that the ideal for manhood is the fierce and handsome warrior. Public leadership is associated with male dominance. Women are prohibited from public or political participation. Most public interaction is between men. Boys and girls are systematically separated at an early age. Initiation is focused on lengthy constraint of boys. When boys are separated from women, taught male solidarity, bellicosity, and endurance, trained to accept the dominance of older groups. Emotional displays of virility, ferocity, and sexuality are highly elaborated. The ritual celebration of fertility focuses on male generative, generative ability, right, rather than female. And men's economic activity are the products of male labor priced over female. So now, so this tells us where it comes from. It comes from that sense of in the, the ideas of initiation leading to that in, in sense of entitlement. I went through this, therefore I'm entitled to the rewards. It has to do with separation of boys and girls at an early age. It has to do with prizing in pu public experiences of men.
finally, one more quote, and then I'll move on. This is one of my favorite quotes. Next, next slide, please. This is one of my, my favorite quotes because from Bruce Springsteen, 1979, um, probably his darkest album, uh, I think his best, um, in which he talks about the origins of men's violence toward women, children, and other men. He says, and th listen to this in terms of entitlement, shame, humiliation. He says, I've done the best to live the right way. I get up every morning and go to work each day. But your eyes go blind and your blood runs cold. And here's the most important line. Sometimes I feel so weak, I just want to explode. Explode and tear this whole town apart. Take a knife and cut this pain from my heart. Find somebody itching for something to start. This is the origin, I believe, of men's violence, both at the public and the personal level. So how do we address this? Next slide, and it'll be my, my almost my last slide, okay. What enables men to get out of the movement? What enables young boys to be resilient, to take, uh, to be able to, you know, to, uh, to withstand the bullying, the homophobic taunts, the constant gender policing? Well, there are four, um, there, there are four answers to this. Um, they're, they're not all labeled number one. Um, and the first is what they call the charismatic adult. So if you're talking about young boys, you're talking about men and boys, what enables them to withstand it? What enables them to get through this gauntlet of temptations for restoring masculinity through violence? One is for young men, the charismatic adult. Some grown-up who sees the boy, who sees him as okay and can validate him. Uh, it could be a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, an older brother, a coach. Most boys that I've talked to say coaches are really important. Could be a religious figure. Secondly, a good male friend. Not a bro, not one of the pack, but a friend, a real friend who can validate your masculinity, who can say, I, I'm, you know, I, I know what they say about you, but I see you. I, I think you're a real guy. You're okay. A good female friend. Now, this is not necessarily uh, a girlfriend. It's a girl who is a friend. But a girl who is a friend for a straight boy can be very validating about his sexuality. Can say, yes, you know, that he's not uh, he, that he doesn't have to prove that he's not gay. She sees him. Finally, what enables guys to get out of the movement? Getting out of the, the neo-Nazi white supremacist movement is not easy. Um, and so many of, these, many of these guys have a really hard time with it. And one of the things that I found was they cannot get out without a place to land. They cannot get out without a solid relationship. That's often the motivation for leaving. A parent, a parent who says, you have to choose between the movement and us. A partner or a wife who says the same thing, says, you know, this is awful, I don't like it, don't do this anymore, or I'm out. And finally, um, I have, several of the guys told me, holding my baby for the first time um, after my, my partner or my wife had given birth and seeing this as, you know, what kind of world am I bringing this child into? These are the things that enable guys to get out. Um, so let me just, let me uh, offer one, uh, one comment. And then, um, and then one, so next slide, please. Um, this is, you know, my last act of self-promotion. I don't mean, you know, I, I want to make sure that you're aware that this, that this uh, co-authored book with Michael Kaufman um, will be co soon translated into Russian. Now, let me just say one thing about this talk. Everyone who's been listening to me knows full well that this talk has been about Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. That is to say, it's about the fear of being small. It's about the fear of appearing small. It's about the, what you do to compensate for feeling small. Violence is the way that men ought have been taught for many centuries to compensate for their fear of being small. It's about small men and a big idea of masculinity. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I look forward to your questions and comments. 
Thank you so much, Michael. There is still a problem with your video, so, but I don't think we can. I'm so do sorry. I, can, I keep, I'll stop it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the host has stopped it, it says, okay. <laughs> we'll only see myself, which is weird. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so now questions. Um, у меня вопрос к спикеру. Есть ли данные о связи таких убеждений и бедности? Есть ли у нас основания полагать, что отказываясь от милитаризированной мускулинности и мускулинности, основанной на насилии и стыде, мы сможем победить насилие в мире? Или мы всегда видим рост таких настроений там, где возникают те же условия, что предшествуют войне? Um, yeah, so uh, let me uh, let me see if I can address this. Um, I think, you know, I think violence and war are inevitable. On the other hand, I think that historically we are probably less violent as cultures today because we've recognized than, than we have been in the past. Um, you know, sometimes my students have romanticized uh, earlier periods like medieval Europe. Um, And I, I, I want to make sure that they're aware of the, the level of violence was far greater the le because the levels of entitlement have been so, have, been, have also been re more regulated. So I think it's inevitable. I think it's re being reduced. And I think if we, if we find some ways, here's the, the takeaway from me. Um, I believe that if we can reduce the gender policing that boys do to other boys, if we can feel more confident and more comfortable in a variety of different masculinities, then we will be able to reduce that sense, that fear of shame, that fear, you know. So in, in that sense, I think reducing homophobia, reducing gender policing can give a wider spectrum of, 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 of boys the ability to feel more confident, and therefore violence will be a less common recourse for, for them. So we have to do two things. We have to reduce the sense of shame and gender policing. And of course, at the collective level, at the policy level, we have to also address the question of men's entitlement. Because the entitlement to use violence is also the, a sort of a predictor of the use of violence. Um, следующий вопрос по-английски. Мне всем придется его перевести, поэтому пишите на русском лучше. Можете ли вы, пожалуйста, um, пояснить, как uh, друг uh, женского пола uh, может um, под подтвердить сексуальность парня, мужчины? Uh, okay, great. Um, so, yeah, this is, um, this is the source of so much of my optimism um uh in, in, in politically uh around gender relations is uh, uh is the single i think the single greatest um uh transformation of young people's lives at least in the u.s and i can't speak at all for russia of course but at least in the u.s is cross-sex friendships young people are far more likely to have cross-sex friendships and this confuses their older parents and grandparents because It was much less common uh, in, in earlier eras, but now I think young people have, and so how does this, how does this work? The, the, the female friend validates his sexuality, if, if he's heterosexual, not by being a sexual partner, but by just saying, I see you as a cool guy. Having a girl say that, having a girl say that, I see you as, as a guy. I see, you know, girls are attracted to you. I can see it validates him in a way that remembers so much of the gender policing is about sexuality. So much gender policing is you're not a real man because you must be gay, which means you must be feminine, which must be, you must be a woman. Um, and the idea for these guys is uh, that what, what a female friend can do is say, no, no, I see you. 
I, you know, I can see why girls would be attracted to you, can validate their sexuality in that way. Again, this is, this is, you know, for, for, for heterosexual guys, um, you know, and, and who, who need the validation that their masculinity, ma masculinity and sexuality or gender and sexuality are so intimately linked that we often read sexuality through gender performance, right? We know someone is gay if they behave like a girl, for example. That would be the argument, I, I think. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Следующий вопрос. Um, кажется, что стыд, страх и беспомощность, uh, что um, является основой для um, насилия, часто связаны с сексуальностью. Часто связывают um, право на обладание женщиной, право на um, то, чтобы быть видимым как um, um, конкурентным, не быть геем, например, и э, быть финансово успешным э, сексуальным партнером – это защита э, потомства. Кроме этого э, эволюционного, э, как это сказать, основы этого эволюционной основы, которая за этим стоит, как это связано с э, западной культурной средой? Yeah. Um, so this is very, this is very interesting um, for, for two reasons. One of which is that cross-cultural research has been so valuable because it shows us that it's not necessary that it be this way. That the arrangements that we have, for example, in the West are not, are not necessarily the kinds of arrangements that you would find in other places. This is so valuable. The, 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 if you remember the slide that I had at the very end, where I talked about the various traits um, that predict um, that violence, this was, these were, um, were uh, offered by two uh, Norwegian anthropologists who surveyed all of the, the countries that they, you know, all the cultures that they could find. And the book was called Societies at Peace. And they said, what, you know, there are plenty of societies where there's no violence against, no or very little violence, uh, men's violence against women, very little warrior culture. What, how can we look more like them? Don't, what lessons do they serve us? Because if you can, if you find cultures that have a different set of arrangements, you, you can undermine some of the evolutionary necessity of men's power over women. So it means that um, so, so I think that that's one of the really vital parts of cross-cultural research is to show us that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, it was another part of the question, which I've forgotten. So if, if, if you could repeat it, that would help. Кроме эволюционной, эволюционной перспективы, как это связано с западной культурной традицией средой? Well, sure. I mean, there's no inevitable link, for example, between gender and sexuality. It's not necessary that we do that we read people's sexuality through their gender performance. Um, but there are many, you know, but there, but in our culture, we raise boys and girls to be different. We have a sense of what those differences are. And then we're surprised to see that on every, every variable except, except violence, men and women roughly have the same abilities, the same competencies, the same, um, the same ideas, the same levels of creativity. It's really amazing to me that we, we, we raise boys and girls to be so different, and yet we're so undifferent. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, let, me just, let me just say one more thing about this. I yeah. believe, and I think this has a kind of a, 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 an answer to the Western part as well. I think we often assume that difference leads to inequality. That because we're different, therefore we would be unequal. Um, this is a foundational idea in, in Western liberal 
thinking. I believe it's the opposite. I believe inequality causes difference. That when you raise people in unequal circumstances, they will develop differences that you can then observe and pretend are real. If you raise people equally, they would be different. They would be different, but mute, but but equal. And I think that would be a very different way to to um, uh, to, to raise to raise boys and girls. Mm -hmm. um, спасибо. Спасибо большое за лекцию. У меня вопрос um, по поводу факторов противостояния этим нарративам. Прозвучавшие факторы очень межличностные. Как вам кажется, в каком просвещении, в какого рода образовательных проектах может выражаться противостояние нарративам такой традиционной маскулинности? Uh, very good question. Um, uh, although I have to say, I tried to be balanced between the interpersonal and the, the social uh, analysis, um, and, but to show that they both come from the same source. So it seems to me that one of the things, now this is, you know, a, 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 as Polina may have mentioned, um, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a sociologist. So I think as well as profiling the, the school the, the, the school shooters, we also need to profile the, the schools they go to because I think many, because I think they all have a profile. They're all almost entirely white. They are all very, they tend to be much, very evangelical Christian. And what that means is there's one single model um, of what is okay for boys and what's okay for girls. And if you deviate from that in any way, you will be a target. So the more diverse the school, the less likely school shootings are, I would, I would propose. Now, if that's true, then what we can do is we can find ways for boys and, and girls for that matter, to find a place where they can feel comfortable and safe in schools, where they don't have to conform to one hierarchy, where there are lots of different groups. So for example, in uh, in Columbine, if you weren't one of the jocks, one of the athletes and cheerleader types, if you weren't that, then your only uh, your only other option was to you know was to be target. But if you have a group, a, a school where you say, all right, so um, you know I'm not one of the athletes and 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 the popular kids, but I'm you know I'm 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 into computers or I'm into games or I'm into goth or I'm into you know emo culture or I'm into something else, and you have a group that you could be part of, then you're much less likely to be a target. Um, so I think diversity is, is really important and teaching teachers to be aware of who might be vulnerable to help them find their way is also very important because that's the charis potential charismatic adult. Sorry, I didn't want to go too long. Спасибо. Еще пара вопросов. Мы, наверное, здесь остановимся. Хочется спросить, Майкл, у вас, что вы знаете о сексуальном насилии, совершенном за компанию, чтобы доказать свою мускулинность перед другими? Our, part, our membership in the group of guys may require us to do things that go against our values um, because we want so desperately to not be a target ourselves, to, you know, that we are willing to do all sorts of things to, you know, to target others or participate in it or be silent about it. Um, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you my own story for a moment then. Um, when I was in uh, high school, um, the boy who had the locker next to me in the gym um, was the target of bullies. And one day they came to the, you know, they were in the locker room and they pushed him against the locker and they were yelling at him and threatening him. And I had the locker next to him. I was right there. Now, everybody who's listening to me right now, there's 111 participants. 
in this in this uh, meeting. All 111 of you know that it's what what you're supposed to do if somebody is being bullied next to you. You're supposed to do something. You're supposed to stand stand up for him. You're supposed to say something. You're supposed to at least say stop. I didn't. I still am ashamed of my behavior from that day. That was, you know, 60 years ago. And I'm still ashamed of it because I did the wrong thing. But I was so afraid that if I did the right thing, they would I would become a target. I think this is something that is so powerful for young men that if I do the right thing, I will become a target. They will go after me. I can't do it. And so I think what we need to do is find ways to enable boys to support other boys in confronting other boys. And I think that that is really, really vital. We need to empower boys to stand up to other boys, but you can't do it alone. You need support. So I think that's part of our analysis is we need to su support boys, empower boys to stand up to other boys so that uh, and but we need to support them by other boys doing it because this is what gender policing does. It makes us afraid of the group. Спасибо. У нас еще четыре вопроса. Мы возьмем все. Как вы думаете? How, how many? Four. Four. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. Первый. I mean, it, it, it's your time. Um, because I didn't know how long we were supposed to go, so I didn't want to go too too much over. Yeah, we have a long break, so okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, интересно, как по мнению, как по вашему мнению, способствует ли изменение взгляда на гендер бинарного на множественный изменению ситуации с маскулинностью и насилием? Uh, I think this is a really important question, one that I've thought about uh, a bit, but I feel we're just beginning to understand this. Um, I think we're, you know, the what we're talking about now in academia, of course, is masculinities, plural, as, as opposed to one idea of masculinity. Now, having said that, it's also true that mas those masculinities are not simply flat and horizontal, they're arranged vertically in a hierarchy of race, of class, of sexuality, of size, age, etc. So, um, and I think that the, the breaking of the gender binary opens up an enormous number of possibilities. I think, the, it, I think we're living in a moment of tremendous excitement about the potential for breaking this binary in terms of identities. And I think as a result, we are witnessing one of the most significant backlashes and efforts to reassert the binary against that. Uh, here in the States where, you know, where, where, where gender identities are exploding along a continuum and states and conservatives are, are trying to legislate against it. Um, so it's, it's a time of tremendous conflict, but I think the potential is enormous. Mm -hmm. Снова про друзей девушек. Как это сочетается с проблемой френд-зоны? Когда мужчины ненавидят женщин за это, за то, что они во френд-зоне. Получается, все же должен быть сексуальный подтекст в этих отношениях. That's a good question. You know, um... Look, these are very complicated arrangements. Um, I think, I'm, I'm thinking now of watching my son navigate, you know, primary school, middle school, high school, and university life. And he has several, girl, gr several girls who are friends and only friends, and that was wonderful um, and very validating for him. Um, I think the friend zone is a slightly different question. That's not about a, the, a, that's not the positive expression of a friendship. That's the, in, that's the expression of romantic or sexual interest in someone who doesn't reciprocate. And therefore, because she doesn't reciprocate, you're put in a friend zone. 
That is to say, you are relegated, you're put down. That can make many men, remember, being put down, that fear of, sh uh, that shame that comes from being rejected, feeling small, but feeling entitled, can make many, many of those friend zone relationships potentially volatile. Uh, but I think there's a real difference between cross-sex friendships and being put in the friend zone. Now, and, and let me just say, of course, there are plenty of cases, I'm sure every one of you knows cases where you thought you were friends, but then someone expresses sexual interest, and then you have to renegotiate the whole thing, and sometimes you lose the friend, sometimes you become friends with benefits, sometimes you, you become romantically involved. Or sometimes they're in the friend zone and it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, следующий вопрос, продолжение про френд um, Что делать, если все-таки um, валидация сексуальности от подруги будет восприниматься как предложение сексуальной близости? It, I suppose it could. It could be perceived that way. It could be misperceived that way. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings, but I also, but I think it's it's not so much that the the girl says to the boy, I I you know I see you as a sec as a heterosexual guy. It's more that like, I see you as a guy. Like I see other girls sort of interested in you, and it it can be valid to to his heterosexuality when so much of the gender policing, this is the point that I want to make, so much of the gender policing is about, is through sexuality. That's so gay. You're so gay. Мужественность как будто является инверсией женственности. Одно правило из четырех. При этом в опоре на картинке важный акцент – это женское одобрение и поддержка, и поддержка. Наблюдается огромная связь влияния женственности на мужественность. Мы можем как-то выйти за пределы этого влияния? You know, this is so interesting. Um, when I first started doing this work, you know, I would ask young guys, you know, like, what does it mean to be a man? And they always responded with a series of negatives, not being girly, not being gay, not being effeminate, you know, et cetera. And, and I began to think that masculinity was like, what well, you know, didn't have a kind of positive notion of I should be this, but rather it meant not being that, right? And I think this is the message that so many of us get when we're with, when, when, you know, when we're with other guys is you have to prove your masculinity all the time. You're being constantly policed by other guys down to how you walk, how you talk, how you dress, how you move, how you interact with other people. Um, and, and so that gender policing is, is, is I think, um, really important. And one of the things that's really is so interesting here is it seems like it would be a contradiction. On the one hand, we have this sort of don't be like girls. And then you need, or we, it, one of the things that predicts resilience would be a female friend. But the female friend can validate masculinity in a way that's different from other guys, I think. That's really all I was trying to say. Thank you so much. That's all the questions. And now um, we'd like to invite you to pick a, the best question because we have some present for a best question. So which question did you like? <laughs> uh, oh, I like them all, but, um, but I think I'll go with the one of that, that asked me about evolution. Um, yeah. Okay. Because I think that opens up the, the you know, it opens up the cross-cultural and it and it, and it, and the cross-cultural undermines the evolutionary imperative that it has to be this way. 
And I think politically, that's what we all look for. We look for a way to undermine the sense of inevitability about the way things are right now. We're looking for ways to say it doesn't have to be this way. Great. So, Алина, кажется, книга ваша. Сейчас вам напишут волонтеры. Michael, thank you so much. It's uh, sad I can't see you, but thank you so much. I'm pausing the recording.